Jack is a native of South Africa with degrees from universities in Cape Town, uh, Oxford University, University of Pennsylvania. His company, Diamond Schmidt, has won more than 150 awards for its work, and Jack himself is an officer of the Order of Canada and a member of the Order of Ontario. His work graces the skylines of Jerusalem, Washington, D.C., Prague, and not to forget Medicine Hat, Alberta, and many other faraway places. And yet my first encounter with Jack was very Toronto-centered. About three decades ago, I admired this young man, this young designer, as a trailblazing champion of historical preservation here in Toronto, at a time when this city was the fastest growing city in North America and the forces seeking to demolish our neighborhoods and our past were almost irresistible. Jack stood up to that. He found ways of preserving buildings in a way that was commercially viable. He was alone in, in doing that. There are many people now doing that. In fact, that's now our number one priority in, in many parts of architecture. But in 1970 and 1975, that, that was certainly not the idea. The idea was just to knock down everything in sight and put up something that was a lot bigger and so you had what Mr. Wright described as box on box on box. He was not a fan of me, of me as Ventura, but then it was a mutual hatred society. <clears throat> so that was my first encounter with Jack. I was admiring this 30 years ago, and I'm sorry if I'm dating either of us here, but he then went on to, uh, well, pretty much at the same time, to pioneer human scale residential complexes where apartment buildings used to be put up. And he was in the vanguard of proving the viability of intensified development in the city as an alternative to suburban sprawl. Which means in sum that Jack could put up a building on the moon and I would still think of him as an ambassador of Toronto values of neighborhoods and human scale development. As a, lot of, as a lifetime uh, Torontonian, I, I want to thank Jack for his vision of our city and for keeping faith with that vision even as he has become an internationally acclaimed uh, designer. And with that, I would like to introduce our special guest tonight, Mr. Jack Diamond. I can live up to that. Uh, you said that. You already have. You said that um, your mother would have liked, <laughs> liked that introduction. It's, a, it's an introduction that you gave me that I think my, my father would have um, found surprising and my mother would have believed. <laughs> Jack, uh, can, can folks hear me? Yeah. Um, intermittently, and I'm not sure when, I'm not in control of these events, Jack is going to suddenly pop up and start sketching, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, that's going to be a real treat. Um, but it'll be very much uh, in, in, in keeping with the designer's art. Um, I mentioned, Jack, that we, that we live uh, in an age of larger-than-life buildings uh, that seem designed to call attention to themselves rather than what's going on inside them. And you said that iconic buildings often address only one aspect of design. And I guess what I'd like to know is what's missing in architecture today, and maybe for the last decade. Well, that, that leads to an extraordinarily interesting, for me, subject. Well, I should tell it to you, you'll tell me if it's interesting. Um, <laughs> the, um, if you look at Historically, if you look at the buildings that have dominated each society, take the pyramids. Uh, the contrast between the pyramid and the hovels for the fellaheen was quite significant. You knew where the power lay. Uh, between the 11th and the 17th century, we'll say, it was clear in Europe the church was the dominant force. The cathedral dominated the city. In the 20th century, the banks. You look at any city, you'll see the biggest building is the most powerful location of the building with the banks. And in the late 20th century and the early 21st century, 
It seemed to me that it was individualism gone crazy. Even the Pope called it uh, excessive capitalism. And individualism was taken to an extraordinary degree, particularly in the United States, where individualism trumps community interest. And so it's not surprising that in every age, architecture is a reflection of the society's values and power. So just as the pyramids clearly demonstrated the power of Pharaoh, so the cookie buildings demonstrates the excessive individualism. What's brilliant about it, when I first came to Toronto, I really thought I'd made a huge mistake. Um, it's, it seemed to me to be a town of Presbyterian happiness and, uh, and architectural mediocrity. Um, but what I began to realize, and it wasn't at first evident, that it was a brilliant city that didn't hit you in the eye the first time around. We have possibly one of the most interesting uh, distributions of buildings that I know. The Toronto, uh, perhaps for Toronto is not quite aware of it. We've got the old um, division lines that were set up for the farming communities uh, are now our arterial streets. They were done for the four block farms, about a mile and a quarter, a mile long. And those became the arterial streets. Along those streets, you've got medium-rise buildings with the butcher, the baker, the dry cleaner, and all the local services. At the intersection of these, what I call super blocks, you have a regional interest. And if you look at downtown as the banking, then there becomes a uh, retailing, then corporate office headquarters, and so on. Unlike cities which have a core that everybody has to get to, and therefore are hugely congested, We've got a city structure that could be expanded infinitely, and inside of that block, low-scale residential. I mean, when visitors come here, particularly to the United States, they can't believe that uh, next to Forest Hill, or one of the highest-priced areas in the city, you have shopping, retail uses, mixed uses. So you have this calibration of low-scale residential protected by the ring road of five- and six-story buildings of the arterial streets where they intersect larger buildings. And if you look at it from the air, you can see these clumps marching out into the landscape. And that's where we put our public transit system. So you've got little streets for houses, not through traffic, but if you need to, on a congested, you have a bypass. The biggest congestion we have is where the road engineers have designed highways in the suburbs. That's where the biggest traffic jams occur, because there are no alternatives. Uh, they deliberately exclude rightly so in some respects from the residential enclaves because they're all dead ends and circular roads. But the simple grid provides because it's a narrow street you can't zoom through it at 80 miles an hour. So you have this very extraordinary structure and then it's relieved by the ravine system. <coughs> and the next thing that's very Canadian is that we accord, we don't need iconic buildings to give them distinction. What we do is we break the grid you think about it, City Hall is at the head of Bay Street, Queen's Park is at the head of Avenue Road, Oscar is the Oscar Hall, the courts at the head of York, and the old labs at the head of Spadina. We give them pride of place. Canadians believe in their institutions. Government isn't just the problem as it is the United States or seem to be, it's part of the solution. There's this balance between public and private interest. And it reflects Canadian society remarkably well. If you get a brilliant building at the head of the street, so much the better. But we never give it a commercial. We never allow commercial buildings in those positions of private place. 